On behalf of our class and entire law school, it is a privilege to introduce our graduation speaker. David Baldacci was born in Virginia, where he continues to reside, and where he is an active board member of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Mr. Baldacci received his Bachelor of Arts from Virginia Commonwealth University, and exactly 20 years ago, he graduated from UVA Law. He then practiced law for nine years in Washington, D.C. as both a trial and corporate attorney. David Baldacci is a great example of the remarks made by the old ball coach in this year's libel show. <laughs> Each of you will be a lawyer, he said, but it is your other talents and characteristics that make you special. Mr. Baldacci burst onto the literary scene in 1996 with his first novel, Absolute Powell, Power. Sorry. He has since written 10 additional best-selling works and has started a novel series for young readers, Freddie and the French Fries. David Baldacci's works have been translated into 38 languages and sold in more than 80 countries. All of his books have been national and international bestsellers and nearly 50 million copies of them are in print worldwide. His good works are also widespread, including his current position as U.S. Ambassador for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. We are extremely proud to call him our own. Please help us welcome David Baldacci. If I knew they were going to introduce me, I would have brought my twin with me today. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to be here. As a nervous and sometimes terrified first-year student at this illustrious institution, I can assure you I never contemplated being asked back for any reason, <laughs> much less to give the commencement address. My only goal back then was simple. That was to survive. I don't remember who spoke at my graduation. It might have been because I just don't remember for substance abuse reasons or whatever, but I don't remember. <laughs> I do remember that it was 95 degrees outside, much hotter than it is today, and the speaker went on for a very, very long time, and I will not put you through that today. When I go out on book tour and I'm traveling, people ask me a lot of questions. The question I get more than any other is, what is it like to be a number one best-selling novelist? And I know the way they ask the question, they expect some glamorous, glitzy answer, you know. I get up at noon every day, and I put on my favorite smoking jacket, and I have fuzzy little slippers and the fuzzy little dog that I carry under my arm. And I go down to my study where a cadre of secretaries is waiting to write down my every utterance. Of course, it's not like that at all. So instead, in answer to that question, what is it like to be a best-selling novelist, I tell them a story about my kids. Until my daughter was three years old, if you asked her what her dad did for a living, she would say, my dad signs books. That's all he does. I don't understand it, but he makes a pretty good living. <laughs> now, she must have passed his wisdom on to her little brother. When I took my son to a bookstore for the first time, he was about three, and we walked in, and he saw all these books and all these people reading, and his eyes grew really huge, and all of a sudden, he took off running across the bookstore at the top of his speed, screaming at the top of his lungs, my daddy will sign any book you have for $2. <laughs> So that's what it's like to be a best-selling novelist. <laughs> I suspect I was invited here today partly because I'm a pretty example of what you can do different with a law degree. However, being a lawyer was great training for being a novelist. A lot of people come up to me and say, you know, it seems like there are a lot of lawyers writing fiction these days. And I say right back, well, some of the best fiction I ever wrote was when I was a lawyer. <laughs> I'm a big proponent of this axiom. The future is never so different that the past becomes irrelevant. We're always better off for knowing what came before. We learn from history, we learn from mistakes, and we also learn from triumphs. So I thought I'd take you through a very brief walk back in time when I graduated from this university in 1986. Then the world was in pretty good shape, although it was marred by the Challenger Space Shuttle and Chernobyl disasters. The Berlin Wall had not yet fallen, but Reagan and Gorbachev were talking consistently, and it was clear that the Cold War would soon be over. While there were global skirmishes from time to time, there was nothing, nothing like a rock on the horizon. The economy was doing all right. Jobs seemed plentiful. 
The rich, of course, were growing steadily richer. The middle class seemed to be doing okay as well. However, not too many politicians or mainstream media talk much about the poor. Virtually no American had heard of Al-Qaeda or Osama bin Laden. Terrorism did exist, of course, but not here. The events of 9-11 would only have been the grist for a really, really bad television movie. And no one in authority seemed to seriously contemplate that a Muslim versus the West Armageddon was a possibility. All in all, things seemed to be sailing along pretty well. Now, the practice of law back then was, as it is today, intense and very competitive. Faxes, if you can believe it, were the fastest form of communication back then, other than the telephone. My first law firm, in fact, still used typewriters. And they even had a telex, whatever the hell that is. No one sat in a courtroom with a laptop doing direct or cross-examination because they didn't exist. Shepherdizing was done by hand because, guess what, that was the only way to do it. No one had cell phones. The internet, as we know and use it today, simply didn't exist. As a lawyer, I saw little bits and pieces of my hourly existence, and I was paid to think about problems that clients had neither the time, nor patience, nor expertise to undertake. Many of you will do that, too. Only your hourly rates and compensation will be far higher than mine. If we won a particular case, it was because truth, justice, and the American way were on our side. If we lost, the client would say it was our fault. The 80s and 90s involved a lot of change. But there's always one compelling certainty. Everyone was trying to get ahead. Competition was fierce, and it was kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, certainly at the law firm level, and I would guess in most other sectors of business as well. That is the capitalistic way, after all, to beat the competition. Now, there could only be one winner, and losing was not an option. Though, if you think about it, with only one winner, that meant most of us would be confined to the category of losers. And yet, with all that, it seemed to work pretty well for all or at least most. And the new millennium, your millennium, seems to be shaping up much like the decades and centuries that came before. Which brings me full circle to my earlier statement. The future is never so different that the past becomes irrelevant. However, having thought about that recently, I think I have to modify that statement. The future, your future, and to a lesser extent mine, is shaping up to be very different than the past. Promises that were given to past generations don't seem to be holding up for you, like having assistance in your old age, of being sure that certain core constitutional rights will always be respected, that loyalty to employers will be reflected back to you, that we will have the core natural resources to keep this world running, or that the very earth in which we are all standing presently will remain in its current state for your lifetime. I can probably count on some of that. The same probably cannot be said for you. Long before you were born, a president during his inauguration speech said these words, ask not what your country can do for you, but instead ask what you can do for your country. The president, of course, was John Kennedy, and I am certain that no president since has made that same plea. If I were to say the words today, I would have to modify them to read, ask not what your world can do for you, but what you can do for your world. For truly, we are global now. At least everybody tells us that we are. And what is the state of the world right now? As sea levels rise along with global temperatures, as wars are fought in foreign lands, as the haves have more and the have-nots have even less, as violent protests erupt right here over who has the right to be a citizen of this country, as religions clash over a whole host of differences, as blue and red states and their elected officials hunker down to ensure that no progress can be made on any issue, as nuclear weapons start appearing in the hands of countries that never possessed them before. It seems to me that the world is teeming with two things right now, ignorance and intolerance. Now, ignorance and intolerance are history's evil twin superstars. You'll never find one without the other. They feed off one another, growing stronger every day. They are at the epicenter of every man-made catastrophe over recorded time. As surely as the doctor tracing disease in a body, 
A social historian can track all that has gone terribly wrong with the world mosaic to those two fundamental failings of the human identity, ignorance and intolerance. What we need now more than ever is a literate, broad-minded, well-read population, and we're actually brimming with the complete opposite. You are the exception. Every census you look at, every demographic survey, every study, every test confirms that the U.S. and the rest of the world are becoming illiterate and illiterate at increasingly an alarming rate. Now, fans of ignorance and intolerance, lovers of all that is wrong with the world today, revel in this news. We apparently don't read anymore. We don't think about large social issues with the gravitas they deserve. We don't synthesize life data and arrive at our own opinions and ideas. We rely on others to tell us what to think, what to believe, whether it's people flying planes in the buildings in the name of God, or that Americans have the rock bed right to hold an arsenal of guns in their home. We are cliff noting through life. However, what is at stake is not a passing grade on a test, but rather the world itself. Our greatest rights as citizens living in a democracy are all based on words, words you know very well. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, exercise of religious freedom. Yet what do these rights mean if we don't exercise them, think about them, defend them, or even know that they exist? I personally was appalled when I heard about the NSA surveillance scandal. Primarily because I was upset that people weren't more concerned about the possible usurpation of the Fourth Amendment rights. When I was discussing this with a friend of mine, he pointed out the fact that most people have no idea what the Fourth Amendment is, so how could they miss what they don't know that they have? So what can we do about this? More to the point, what can you do about this? The truth is you are uniquely trained to do something about this, perhaps something big. As lawyers, you are equipped to sweat the small details and never lose sight of the big picture. You are well-read, opinionated, and very well aware of the fundamental rights that govern this country and many lands across the world. And like it or not, in the future, you will hold positions of authority that have great impact over your fellow citizens. I recently attended my alumni weekend here. My classmates, in addition to being practicing lawyers, are judges, business leaders, politicians. Many chase the typical American dream, while others work on behalf of the poor, the underrepresented, working to make laws that no longer make sense obsolete, working to enact new ones that make sense. In tackling the immense problems that we will shape our world for decades, if not centuries to come, soon you too will step into those roles, whether you want to or not. You will make those sorts of decisions. But there's a difference. The perspectives and prospects of America have changed since I graduated from this school. Indeed, to much of the world, America is seen only as a consumer nation. When we were giving our tax relief check a few years ago, even the president of the U.S. got into the act and said, spend this money. Don't save it. Spend it to help the economy. The argument goes that we don't make anything anymore. All we do is consume. Consequently, that is our defining role for this millennium and perhaps beyond, as other rising nations elbow us aside in the race to lead the world. Now, I know, and I think that you know, too, that being consumers is not our primary role in life. That is not how this country was founded, and it is clearly not how this land became great. I refuse to believe that our defining attributes as a people will consist of how many cars, refrigerators, and CDs we collectively buy over our lifetimes. And yet, with all that America has accomplished over the centuries, even the greatest nations have to recreate themselves from time to time, or else be resigned to never being what they once were. I think maybe it's come time for this nation to recreate themselves as well. And to do so, we have to look forward, but we also have to look backward to see what this country once was, however distilled of the mistakes and prejudices and wrong decisions that marred the underlying spirit of a great nation that is the world's longest enduring democratic experience. And as Winston Churchill once said, democracy is the absolute worst form of government that there is, you know, except for all the others. This country has overcome much in its history. We have overcome a great civil war that was fought over the most fundamental human right of all, that of personal liberty. So we can look at our past 
and learn, but then we must take one step that other generations have never had to do. We have to ask ourselves, you have to ask yourself, not what the world can do for you, but what you can do for the world. For it is crystal clear now, more than ever, that the human race is in this together. For better or worse, until death do us part, there's never been a greater need for that collective spirit and that mindset than there is today. And this country and its people have a unique opportunity to lead the world in new and creative directions, to leave a mark on history that will never be forgotten or blemished. But you also, as a generation, have a challenge to face that no other generation has had to confront. The pace of life is far swifter now. It seems that we are totally electronic and wired 24-7, that society demands that we work as fast and as efficiently as computers. That is a potentially catastrophic scenario. You receive an email and response expected, expected not in weeks or days or hours or even minutes, but in seconds. Resist the temptation in your life or your strength to the only true advantage that we have over every other species on this earth, and that is our mind. The human brain can work well under pressure, but often quick answers are wrong answers. No client you will ever represent will thank you or remember you fondly for giving the fastest answer to a question if it turns out to be wrong. There is no shame in saying, I need to think about it. We can take a page from another president many consider the greatest of all time. Abe Lincoln made a practice of writing personal condolence notes to mothers who had lost sons in the Civil War. In one famous letter, he wrote to a grieving mother who had involuntarily sacrificed five of her sons to the cause of the Union. In closing, he had said something to the effect that, Madam, I apologize for the length of this letter. If I'd had more time to write it, it would have been far shorter. Later, Lincoln used a quite a bit of time and thought in composing the Gettysburg Address, the shortest speech of his career, fewer than 300 words long, and still considered the greatest American political statement in history. A Pentium 4 chip, a DSL connection, a BlackBerry in and of themselves do not preordain or conjure up good decisions. The tetrabytes of data that free range over the internet are useless, useless, unless human beings take the time to distill them into something of true value, like knowledge or even wisdom. It seems sometimes that we're a short-sighted email world with long-term snail mail problems, problems that have no quick fixes, no shortcuts. They can only be solved with reflection and contemplation and the full and unfettered exercise of the greatest tool any of you will ever possess, and that's your mind. Now, there's been much talk in books and movies written about the notion of the greatest generation, the generation that fought World War II. And those folks, my parents included, deserve every accolade they received for doing what they did in that point of history. Yet every generation has the potential to be great. Every generation has the potential to lead the world better than they found it. Some generations clearly have fallen down in that role or even outright abdicated it. Others have risen to the challenge. Now, I didn't remember what the guy he spoke at my graduation said, but years from now, if you remember anything I say today, let it be this. No generation can be great unless there are great challenges confronting it. You have those challenges today in abundance. No generation can be great unless all members realize that sacrifice, compromise, and altruism are not failings, are signs of weakness, and they don't constitute a consolation prize for being second best. They, comp they comprise an honor and a duty collectively held. And remember this, the core strength of greatness is and always will be the human desire to show compassion and understanding to others, regardless of what they look like, what language they speak, or what God they believe in, if any. Hatred bred by ignorance and intolerance has the potential to destroy not simply individual lives or the nations of which they are a part, but the very world we all occupy. So whether books and movies are written about your generation or not, from this day forward, each and every one of you could be the genesis for a world you'd be proud to leave to the next generation. 
there can be no worthier goal than that. So congratulations, class of 2006. Now please go out and shake up the world. Thank you.